This video is dedicated to all the Turks, Armenians, Syrians, Afghanistanians, Lebanese, Judeans, Palestinians, Saudi Arabians, Iranians, Turkmenistans, and Pakistans whose ancestors had lived under the rule of the Seleucid Empire and in modern times only want peace to come to their broken up and poverty stricken lands. May God bless you. The sun flew through the empty skies, its rays beat upon the fully armored infantry battalions. In front of them, their enemy, Antiochus, had called up soldiers as far as Dahe, Sogdiana, Mesopotamia, and Judea, warriors ready to defend their homeland to the death. In front of them was a wall of tusks, the ancient tank, elephants. It seemed to the Roman soldiers that the whole world was about to come crashing down on them. The Battle of Magnesia was about to begin. But how did the two opposing, opposing armies get here and why? This is the documentary on Antiochus the Great, the greatest Seleucid ruler. Born around 241 BC and ascending to the Seleucid throne at 18, Antiochus was given a tough challenge. In the south, Egypt had pushed the Seleucids back as far as Antioch. In the east, a rebel satrap named Molon and his brother Alexander had risen up to create their own kingdom in Media. Antiochus, at just 18, was given the immediate task of attempting to regain his crumbling ancestor's empire. Two men, Her Hermaeus and Epigenes, loyal to Antiochus, had both attempted to throw in their lot and guide the king on what to do next. Epigenes had suggested to attack Molon and crush the revolt. Hermaeus, on the other hand, advised Antiochus to stop the e Egyptian advance in Syria. Antiochus had a choice, follow Epigenes' advice, who was the leader of the army in Syria, or follow Hermaeus' advice, who dominated the court politics. In the end, the he heavily influenced king was made aware of the fact that Epigenes was about to betray him. At the time, Antiochus did not know that Hermaeus had faked this letter, which was supposedly sent by the Egyptians. For the loyal Epigenes, it was to be his last day. Antiochus had him killed immediately and followed the terrible advice of Hermaeus. He was about to attack Egypt. But before he could do this, Antiochus needed to get married and have a child that he could declare as his heir. In the end, he married the daughter of Mithridates II of Pontus, a strange yet useful marriage. With Asia more secure, a child on the way and his court in a somewhat competent hands, Antiochus marched towards Syria. When he arrived in modern Palestine, the forces of Ptolemy were blocking his way to the Bikwa Valley. An Anatolian named Theodotus held the Lebanon and anti-Lebanon mountain ranges. Antiochus's casualties rose and his progress was slow. As this was happening, his new army in Mesopotamia, under the command of a mercenary named Zenon, was decisively defeated. Molon moved to occupy Antioch on the Tigris, but was prevented when a young commander named Zeuxis blocked him. Another mercenary commander was sent to deal with Molon, yet he too was defeated. Antiochus gave up his attack on Palestine and moved back to deal with the situation personally. The situation completely deteriorated when Antiochus found out that he was broke due to the loss of Media and Mesopotamia. Hermaeus, attempting to salvage what was left of his position, decided to personally literally pay for the Seleucid army. This allowed Antiochus to continue east and prepare for a showdown. This also allowed for the imbecile who told Antiochus that attacking Ptolemy was a good idea to regain some prestige. However, that prestige was soon shot down. Antiochus decided to use his young commander Zeuxis to challenge Hermaeus. Hermaeus announced that moving with the Tigris River would give Antiochus the fastest route to attack Molon but ignored the fact that the region was devastated and logistics were impossible. Zeuxis advocated for Antiochus to cross the Tigris and then move perpendicularly to the Tigris into the Apollonia region. Antiochus sided with Zeuxis, thus crushing Hermaeus' prestige. Antiochus surprised Molon, who was in Seleucia on the Tigris, when he blocked his movement north. Molon advanced his army with unknown numbers onto the Apollonia plain. In the very little known fight, the entire left flank of Molon deserted to Antiochus. Antiochus charged and wrapped up the entire army. Molon's body was crucified at the Mount of 
Molon's body was crucified at the base of Mount Zagros for display of anyone else that wanted to revolt. Antiochus now marched north to Atropatini. The owner of the region, Artabarzanes, pledged allegiance to Antiochus after he marched his army through his territory. Western Iran and Mesopotamia were brought back under the Seleucid rule. However, the victory was overlapped by the fact that Achaeus, Antiochus' cousin, also ruler of Asia Minor, revolted. Realizing that if he went to subdue this rebel, Hermaeus, who had fallen out with the king, would also revolt. Not to be one step behind his political opponents, Antiochus had Hermaeus stabbed to death and his wife and kids stoned. Another clear show of what would happen to anyone disloyal. However, when Achaeus, who primarily recruited native Asians, attempted to attack Syria, his army mutinied. Although in 219 BC, Achaeus owned all of the Seleucid possessions in Asia Minor, he was no threat to Antiochus, and thus he left him alone. Instead, Antiochus moved against Seleucia Pieria, a town founded by Seleucus Nicator that had remained in Egyptian hands almost since it was founded. Theodotus, a mercenary, was ordered to block the passes leading to the Bikwa Valley to stop any Egyptian counterforces. Meanwhile, Antiochus was able to bribe a lieutenant into surrendering, surrendering the city and thus allowing him to quickly move south. However, an interesting letter arrived in the Seleucid court from another mercenary named Theodotus. This Theodotus was the commander of forces blocking the si same passes as the other Theodotus. He defected to Antiochus and allowed his forces to cross into the Bikwa Valley. At the same time, Tyre was captured and with it the 40 Egyptian ships that were stationed there. Instead of counterattacking, Ptolemy requested for a truce, which Antiochus readily accepted in an attempt to reorganize his new territory. This truce lasted about as long as modern marriages. Behind closed doors, Ptolemy IV was preparing a massive army for an all-or-nothing battle against Antiochus. While this was happening, Antiochus managed to acquire 10,000 reinforcements from Nabatea, which switched from allying with Ptolemy to Antiochus. In the spring of 217 BC, Ptolemy called off negotiations and declared war on Antiochus. Antiochus gathered his army of 58,000 troops against 75,000 Egyptians. Antiochus had great success near the Phoenician coast when he pushed back a mercenary commander named Nicaulus, killing and capturing 4,000 of his troops. As Ptolemy and Antiochus neared Raph Raphia, modern Rapha, those 10,000 Nabataeans showed up and readily joined Antiochus' army. Now the two generals deployed for one of the most cataclysmic battles in Antiochus' career. 30,000 infantry were deployed in the center, commanded by Hipparchus. Ptolemy deployed 56,000 in heavy infantry, a quite literally overwhelming number. Antiochus deployed 6,000 cal cavalry on the wings, while Ptolemy deployed 5,000. On the right were, were 60 elephants commanded by Antiochus's foster brother. On the left were 40 elephants commanded by Miscus. Ptolemy deployed 73 elephants, but these were smaller and less aggressive than the Indian ones under the command of Antiochus. The battle began with elephants clashed with elephants. Tusks were interlocked, men and mahouts were thrown into the air. In the end, Antiochus's elephants prevailed. The young king now charged on the right flank. His cavalry easily chased Ptolemy's forces off of the field. However, on the left, Ptolemy's general Eucrates smashed through Antiochus's allies, but failed to wrap up the rest of the army. Now it was just the infantry. Thousands of Egyptians and Seleucid heavy infantry converged on each other. In the massive melee engagement that followed, Ptolemy prevailed. Antiochus had utterly failed to regroup and smash the Egyptians in the rear, ending the battle. In the end, over 10,000 Seleucids lay dead on the field that day, while Ptolemy only lost just over 2,000. Antiochus had, rather unfairly in my opinion, blamed the loss of, on his soldiers, while Ptolemy went back to Egypt and became an alcoholic. This defeat had shattered the king's reputation, but, it seemed, but he seemed to be rather unaffected. After the battle, he swiftly blo blocked the passes into the Bikwa Valley and retreated back to Syria, regrouping his army. Three years later, in 214, Antiochus moved against the rebel Achaeus in Asia Minor. Polybius reports that Sardis was sieged immediately, 
and that no set-piece battle ever followed. Apparently, for an entire year, the forces fought one another with Antiochus slowly gaining the upper hand. Finally, an aggressive lieutenant of Antiochus decided to come up with a plan to attack the city at night and open the gates. The confusing affair succeeded and the city was captured. Achaeus, who attempted to flee from the siege at night, was captured. Achaeus' balls were cut off and then his head was cut off. Asia Minor was now Antiochus's. He left Xerxes in command of Asia while he himself turned to Armenia and started his anabasis. Xerxes, the king of Armenia at the time, retreated when he heard Antiochus' advance. Antiochus besieged the city of Arsamosota. When Xerxes' political position was worsening, he sent for peace talks with the king. Antiochus married his daughter Antiochus to Xerxes. He also acquired a thousand horses and a thousand mules along with 300 silver talents. The first victory in his great campaign was more of a propaganda win than anything. From here, Antiochus marched into Media and sacked the temple of Ecbatana, acquiring 4,000 silver talents. He proceeded to march toward Hecatompolis, a rich trading city under the control of the Parthian warlord Arsaces. Arsaces sent forth some cavalry regiments to destroy all the wells which the Seleucids would need for water, but Nicomedes, a cavalry commander, was sent to counter this with 1,000 horsemen. The city quickly fell without a fight. Now Antiochus had a choice to make, rush toward the Parthian heartland directly or move toward the Caspian Sea and pass through a much more fertile region. Antiochus chose the latter and marched toward the Caspian Sea. Unsurprisingly, when he arrived, Arsaces had blocked the pass with infantry. At the city of Syrinx, Antiochus was able to destroy most of these infantry forces. But after this, Antiochus disappears, and then suddenly he reappears at the Parthian capital of Nisa. Arsaces was humbled and his kingdom utterly reduced. Historians have criticized Antiochus for not destroying the Parthian kingdom, but this was not a wise choice as one might think. The Parthians bordered a land that was desolate of towns and only harbored invading tribesmen. To defend this region would have been expensive and useless, so Antiochus made the right choice and allowed Arsaces to rule under him as a satrap. In 208 BC, Antiochus moved toward Bactria, which was ruled by Euthydemos. Euthydemos blocked the Arius River with 10,000 cavalry in an attempt to stop Antiochus. When Antiochus learned that they were only positioned there during the day, He attacked at night and led 10,000 Peltists and 2,000 cavalry across the river. When Euthydemos heard of this, he led his cavalry back to the position and attacked Antiochus. Antiochus fought valiantly in the front lines, even having his horse killed out from underneath him, but the fight was turning against him. Finally, a lieutenant gathered the 10,000 Peltists and charged, finally forcing the Bactrians to retreat. Antiochus moved onward to the capital city of Bactria, named Bactria. After a two-year siege, Euthydemos requested for negotiations. Antiochus accepted. In the end, Euthydemos kept his throne and his son Demetrius was allowed to rule after his death. Once again, Antiochus allowed the kingdom to retain some of its territory, but it was forced to pay tribute and give supplies to Antiochus' army. Antiochus had now protected himself from nomadic invasions from the north. After this, Antiochus moved south toward modern Pakistan and peacefully subdued the region as far as the Indus River. In the meantime, he recruited over 150 Indian elephants, which was the largest number since Seleucus Nicator. He then moved west by going through modern Iran and Carmania and Dragiana. By 205 BC, Antiochus arrived in Babylon and celebrated the new year. However, his journey wasn't over yet. He moved southeast and down into Arabia, an area controlled by the Gurhe. From the Persian Gulf, Antiochus moved back into Syria and then Tios, a city in Asia Minor. In 205 BC, not long after Antiochus' anabasis, Ptolemy IV died. After Raphia, he had gained a reputation for being a junkard. His only heir was a five-year-old boy also named Ptolemy. There were 13 of these people named Ptolemy, by the way. In 203 BC, Antiochus allied with Philip V, king of Macedon, creating a pact to pick apart Egypt's empire. Antiochus invaded. His plan was to loop around the defenders at the anti-Lebanon mountains and then attack into the Gaza Strip. 
He sent some forward cavalry and captured the city of Damascus. After this, he marched his army past the Bikwa Valley and straight at Gaza. After besieging it for a year, the city fell, and now the rest of Qual Qalil, Syria, was open for conquest. Ptolemy was able to raise an army of unknown size and gave it to a mercenary named Scopus. Scopus counterattacked and captured Judea. When Antiochus, who was camping in Apamia, heard this news, he grabbed his army and rushed south. The two forces engaged in what was called the Battle of Panium. What happened is confusing, but it seems that Antiochus' son charged the flank of Scopus' Egyptian army and routed it after that. Finally, in 200 BC, Roman envoys arrived in Antiochus' court. They told the king that he was to abstain from conquering Egypt. Apparently, Antiochus didn't want to conquer Egypt. By the time the Romans left, Antiochus had been declared a friend and ally of Rome. However, Antiochus wasn't done yet. He went back into Coil, Syria, and defeated the remaining 10,000 defenders of Scopus in a siege. After the final siege of Tyre, Antiochus now owned all of... I'm just going to call it southern Syria, and began to administer the new territory. However, new news reached Antiochus. Philip V, his old ally, who had been conquering islands in the Aegean, had been crushed at Kynocephali. His territory and army had been utterly reduced. Realizing it was time for another victory, a more political one, Antiochus married his daughter to Ptolemy, securing himself an alliance with the crumbling kingdom. And then, a brave new soul enters the world, Hannibal Barca. In 194 BC, the greatest general in the world fled Carthage and arrived in the court of Antiochus. However, it seems that Antiochus' pride got in his way and Hannibal was never given command of an army. While this was happening, Antiochus had captured the all but destroyed town of Lysimachia, repopulating it, once owned by a successor of Alexandria, and then captured what is now modern Gallipoli. This was almost the last draw for the Romans. They ha had already sent envoys twice to Antiochus and they were all but ignored. Antiochus had even announced that the Romans had no business in his affairs as he had no business in theirs, which was actually kind of true. However, to Antiochus' somewhat delight and also to his dismay, the Aetolians arrived in his court requesting that he invade Greece and help them throw off Roman rule. Antiochus was somewhat in a pickle. He had just succeeded in a grand campaign across the east and defeated Egypt. Why shouldn't he accept? In his mind, he was superior to Rome. He had the bigger army, the bigger empire, and he himself thought that he was the better general. And he had Hannibal on his side, who must have been coaxing him into war. Finally, although against better judgment, Antiochus agreed. He led 10,000 infantry and 500 horse to Greece and landed at the newly captured city of Demetrius. Marching south, he attacked the island of Chalcis. With the help of his admiral Polyxenitis, he was able to secure this perfect location and even defeated a minor cohort of Romans on the island. He quickly marched back up onto Greece and then forced his army up into Thessaly, capturing the majority of the plain. When he arrived, a very controversial event occurred. He found 8,000 dead Macedonians who had been killed at the battle at Kynocephali. Antiochus, attempting to act in a good faith to the Greeks, buried the dead Macedonians. But this had the almost complete opposite effect. Philip V declared his allegiance to Rome, pinning Antiochus in southern Greece. This was the complete opposite situation that Antiochus was hoping for. By now, the Romans had landed an entire army into Macedonia. Antiochus fled back to the island of Chalcis, where he got married to a gun young girl and nicknamed her Euboea. Sadly for her, her name basically means something along the lines of Happy Cowland. This marriage was supposed to increase Antiochus' position in Greece, yet, once again, this king screwed himself over. The Greek thought of Antiochus as a slut who was satisfying his lust rather than fighting the Romans. Yet, this notion is utterly ridiculous. It was the Aetolians who said that they would support him, 
who failed to give him the extra troops that he needed, thus stopping him from even attempting to fight the Romans. The next year, 191 BC, saw the Roman commander Glabrio assault the newly taken lands in Thessaly and turn over Antiochus's gains. Antiochus rushed into Greece and decided to make a stand at Thermopylae, the ancient battlegrounds for anyone who wanted to stop an invading force. Antiochus was finally aided by 4,000 Aetolians who were placed on the old goat pass. Antiochus himself built a small wall and placed artillery backed by skirmishers and a body of phalanx troops on the main path. When the Romans, who all too well knew about the goat paths, sent forces around them, while well, the main body was assaulted Antiochus' position. However, this was happening at night. One of the Roman units got lost in the paths and was forced to retreat. The other one actually found its target. They attacked and forced the allies back. Antiochus, who was already expecting this, got the news that his allies were defeated, turned and fled before he could be surrounded. 10,000 Seleucid soldiers died that day. Antiochus fled back to Asia. All the while he was gathering his forces that were garrisoned in Thrace, attempting to amass a huge army. In the Aegean, his admiral, Polyxenitis, was engaging Roman and Rhodian allied ships. In the ensuing battle at Sisis, Polyxenitis had the advantage at first, but t he too was utterly astounded when the Romans turned the sea battle into a land battle by boarding the enemy ships. In the end, ten ships were destroyed and thirteen were captured. Polyxenitis retreated his fleet and met up with a pirate named Nicandor. After stalling the Romans with peace talks, Polyxenitis ambushed them at Samos. The Rhodians lost an unknown number of ships and their admiral. Finally, at Ephesus, Polyxenitis was blockaded by Roman and Pergamene ships. At the same time, off the coast of Asia near Sede, Hannibal Barca was arriving with his own fleet attempting to relieve the Seleucid admiral. The Rhodians caught wind of Hannibal's movements and quickly defeated him. This was the last battle that Hannibal would ever fight. The Roman fleet at Ephesus had decided to back away after it was needed at Teos. Polyxenitis took advantage of this and attacked them. In the ensuing battle, Polyxenitis had lost 29 ships and never took part in the war again. Antiochus realized that the situation wasn't terrible, but it wasn't really that great either. He decided to ask Rome for peace talks, emphasizing the fact that he had captured Scipio Africanus' son and would give him back if they accepted peace. But the Roman demands were simply too high. Scipio even said that he should show Antiochus a bit of useful advice by giving his son back and avoiding battle. Antiochus, whose pride was too high, utterly refused. The armies would finally fight. In 190 BC, Antiochus and the Roman forces under the command of Scipio and allied forces of Eumenes. This is about as an in-depth as a deployment of an ancient army you are going to get, so drop the snacks and pay attention. The left wing, commanded by Antiochus' son Seleucus, consisted of 4,000 Peltists, 1,500 Illyrians, 1,500 Cretans and Cilicians, 1,000 Neocretans, 2,500 Galatian Cavalry, 500 Tarentine Cavalry, 1,000 Royal Cavalry, 3,000 Cataphracts, 2,700 Reserve Light Infantry, 2,000 Cappadocians, and sized chariots were in the front and elephants were in the rear. The center was commanded by Philip and another commander named Xuxes. 1,500 Galat Galatian Infantry on the left, 16,000 Phalanx Troops with 22 elephants in between their lines, and 1,500 Galatian troops on the right. Right wing, commanded by Antiochus himself, had 10,000 silver shields next to the phalanx, 3,000 cataphracts, 1,000 agema cavalry, 1,200 dahe cavalry, 3,000 extra light infantry, and 2,500 Mycian archers. The Roman army was positioned as usual in the triple X axes, other than the unusual, other than the usual amount of cavalry on the flanks and infantry in the middle, Eumenes on the right was in command of 3,000 light infantry and 3,000 cavalry. After five days of skirmishing and probing, the battle finally properly began. The battle started off with a scythe chariot charge on the left. The ancient war machine panicked when Eumenes brought up his archers and shot the drivers. The Arabian camels, who were attempting to support the chariots, 
fell into utter chaos when the chariots hit their own men. Eumenes charged, and the entire left flank panicked and fled. On the right, it was the complete opposite. Antiochus had led a massive cavalry charge, forcing the Romans to retreat all the way back to their camp, where they rallied in an attempt to stop the charge. Now, the horrors of 217 BC were flooding back into Antiochus's mind as he realized the grave mistake he had just made. Both forces had crushed the either's wings, leaving the infantry to fight. The Romans advanced and flew through their pila and charged. The elephants, which had been positioned inside of the phalanx, panicked, turned, and thrashed their own men. The beast of war had opened up a chance for a complete Roman victory. Eumenes charged into the flank of the Seleucid phalanx as Roman infantry poured into the gaps. The battle was over. Rome was victorious. The losses are confusing as just as the regular amount of deployed men. But modern historians place the Seleucid losses at 10,000 and the Roman ones at 5,000 due to the fierce fighting on the Roman left. After this battle, Antiochus was in no place to negotiate peace. The Romans crippled his rule by demanding that he withdrew from Asia as far as the Taurus Mountains, pay a war indemnity, and never cross over into Asia again. Antiochus had to agree. What happened next seems to be the fate of typical high-ruling kings. Antiochus, in 187 BC, turned to Babylon. However, he was in debt due to the Roman demands. He decided to loot the ancient treasure at Elam. He, he accused them of starting a war, which in my opinion was a bit far-stretched. The Elams revolted. In the panic that followed, Antiochus the Great was killed. For 36 years, Antiochus had worked his butt off to rebuild the Seleucid Empire, raging wars expanding territory, making himself look like a new Alexander. For far too long has Antiochus been looked at as a fool who replicated the same mistake twice and demonized as a terrible commander. However, this is completely false. Antiochus was a warlord who fought in the front lines and never backed down from a fight. The true problem was that Antiochus has been fighting as if he was Alexander the Great. In Alexander's time, fighting in the front lines worked, although it was very risky. Antiochus was fighting in an age where that was not the case anymore. Hannibal Barca was always behind his army, commanding it, not playing soldier. Napoleon, Roman consuls, and most eastern kings fought behind their army. Even though they were behind it commanding their troops, they were still taking part in the action. Antiochus, who ruled an extremely rundown kingdom, did what all others had failed to do. Bring southern Syria under his rule. Bring back the territories in the east, defeat Egypt, and occupy most of Asia and part of Thrace. At the empire's height, it encompassed 1.5 million square miles could recruit 120,000 soldiers, and his annual revenue peaked at 20,000 silver talents a year. Antiochus had proven to be a warrior who never backed down, never failed to win back his prestige, and most importantly, had grown to become, at least in my eyes, the greatest king of the Seleucid Empire, only narrowly being beaten by the founder, Seleucus Nicator.